Well, good morning and happy Mother's Day. You know, I think one of the most amazing stories about Jesus at the crucifixion is that one of his last statements was about taking care of his mother. As he's dying on the cross, he turns to John, one of his disciples, and he says, you take care of her. Wow. Jesus honored his mother. He took care of her. And today we remember our mothers. My mother is in heaven, so I can't write her a card or call her or say hello, but you know what I can do and did is I bless the memory of my mom and I thank God for all she did for me. And that's what we want to do today in our families. We want to bless the mothers and um, I hope that uh, you will all enjoy the day. Today we begin a series, and it's called Daniel, Thriving in Chaos. Anybody here ever experienced a season of chaos in your life? Anybody? It's like you have no idea what in the world is going on. It's as if the bottom is falling out. Um, Where do you go from here? Uh, circumstances that happened to you, things that you did that destroyed things, uh, maybe what other people have done to you. I mean, the, the truth is, everybody goes through a time of chaos. One of the most dangerous ideas is that if you follow God, that he will never let you experience trouble. He will never let you experience chaos, loss, death, suffering, pain. And that just simply is not true. That's never stated in the Bible. Um, when when, When the bottom drops out of your life, when your health takes a bad turn, when you lose your jobs, your kids are in trouble, or even your spouse walks out on you, trouble becomes your current reality. And many times we ask the question, why God, why? So many times I hear people as they process experiences ask that question. Why did God do that? Why did God let that happen? Why? Now, if you're asking why from a position of humility, saying, God, is there something I need to change? Do I need to do something differently here? I want to repent. I want to do the right thing. But many of the times, and I know for me, my why is not a repentant why. My why is a complaining why to God. Why? Why have you done this? I have followed you. I have given everything I have to you. I, I, I'm doing all I can. And then you let this happen to me? Why? You know, one of the most important things for us to realize is that in this confusing journey of life, it is, it is not our story. You know, when you ask that question, why, in such a way that you're demanding that God make things good for you, you make yourself God. Did you know that it is God's story and you and I are a part of it? But we're not the central focus. And so, uh, God, we have, to, we have to know this, and this is what Daniel knew, that God is always there He is always in control. God is good and he can be trusted. And I I just said a mouthful that is easy to preach and hard to do. How did Daniel thrive in the chaos of his life? Well, this is how. And you see this throughout the book of Daniel. He never forgot that God was in control. He never forgot that God could be trusted. Daniel's story begins when he is 15 years old. And he, he goes to Babylon at 15. And he remains in an influential position of leadership through many kings, many different empires. And he lives to be over 80 years old, still influencing the kingdom. So I've got three points to pull out of Daniel chapter one, which is our text today, if you want to turn there. First thing is troubled, troubled. Daniel chapter one. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, 
came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. And some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure of the house of his God. Now, it is pretty easy to figure out the theology of the writer who is Daniel himself, most likely. He, in the narratives, even in these very few sentences, Daniel describes it as a 15-year-old. He watches the invading enemy army of Nebuchadnezzar come marching to Jerusalem. They besiege the city. The king is defeated. The mighty Babylonian king marches into the house of God, the temple, carries sacred articles back to Babylon and puts them in the treasure house of his God. You know what that is? That's a power move. As Nebuchadnezzar seizes articles, these are sacred articles who identify the relationship of the people of Israel with the God uh, that, that they follow, or at least used to follow. He takes these articles. His intention was to declare, your God doesn't matter to me. I'm the one who's winning here. It was his intention to humiliate God and take the sacred items and put them in the treasury of his God. Now, these articles represent God's presence among his people because you see, they had been identified by God as the special people of God. And now they were humiliated. And the question was, where is God? Now the reason for this dark moment in their history, this judgment time, is very obvious if you read the Old Testament. Do you know why they were going through this? Because of their unfaithfulness as a people to the God who had chosen them and had, had called them to be his very own. I mean, they had left this relationship with God. They now worship idols, sacrificed children to idols. They ignored God, boldly rejected the careful obedience that defined this special relationship with God. And it wasn't that they were blindsided by this judgment. From the beginning of their history, way back in the days of Moses, Moses warned them, if you will value and cherish your relationship with God as expressed in your obedience you will see the blessing of God on you. If you forsake him, he'll forsake you and you'll be carried into exile. God warned them, but they neglected their relationship with God. You know, the prophets had warned them too and they ignored the prophets. From the kings down to the ordinary man and woman, they rejected God. They took him for granted. They still maintained their religion but they had no relationship with God. At 15, Daniel would have been aware of the prophecies of Isaiah. Listen to what Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter one. This, the whole first chapter is, is incredible. But I, for time's sake, we're gonna begin in verse 18. God pleads with a disobedient people. It's Mother's Day. Some of the busiest people on the planet are mothers. You know the great thing about going off to work is, you go off to work, you finish work, and you go home. You know what's difficult about being a mother? Many of whom go off to work, come home, and work again. You know what is a really sad thing? When mothers are taken for granted. It's as if the kids don't care about the relationship. Now, mothers, I'm here to tell you, that's kind of normal child, child development, really. They may come back around later. I mean, I know I, I went through the time when I didn't want to be told by my mother what to do. Anybody here ever felt that? I mean, there were more times than not that I never thanked her for the meals she cooked, the clothes she washed, the way she kept the house running. I just expected her to do all of that. 
I don't know moms long to be remembered, to be thanked, most of all, for their children to just acknowledge that there is a very precious relationship here. You know, the children of Israel had taken God for granted. They had forsaken a heart for God. In Isaiah 1, God pleads with them. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land, but if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You know, when Daniel's world fell apart, he watched the destruction of his people, the capture of the king, the disgracing of the temple and his God. You know, as, as I read through Daniel, it seemed that Daniel had a genuine relationship with God. He didn't just have religion. You know, the truth is, you know who you really are when you get under pressure. When trouble comes, stress reveals the real you. Daniel suffers, even though it had not been his doing. He was only 15 years old. He suffered because of the sins of his ancestors and his contemporaries. But Daniel, even as he writes this book and describes this experience at 15, he, he declares his theology, his love for God, his devotion and his dedication. Two things become apparent. First, Daniel says that the destruction by Nebuchadnezzar was really the result of Nebuchadnezzar's evil destruction. You know, we're watching the war in Ukraine and it's so heartbreaking. That kind of thing was happening in Daniel's world. Secondly, Daniel also clarifies in verse two that even though it's ne Nebuchadnezzar who's doing all of this, that the Lord is the one who gave Jehoiakim the king of Judah into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. This is a complex thing, but there is the actions of people and the sovereignty of God. It's kind of a, it's a mysterious melding of these true two truths, and it is true always in our life. Everything in life is a combination of the activities of people, circumstances of life, under the rule of God. So who is responsible? Nebuchadnezzar was responsible. But God was also at work. God was present. He was aware even of the trouble. In fact, he had warned his people. You, you, need, to, you need to repent or the trouble's gonna come. You know, I love the book of James. Um, James begins his book with this statement, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love James's perspective. James is said to have been the half-brother of Jesus, so he knew Jesus pretty well. James, the bond servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He humbles himself. He's not making demands. He's not declaring expectations. Well, God, if you won't do this, and I'm not gonna believe in you. God, if you don't fulfill my expectations, then I'm, I'm out. No, 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 he's, he's, I'm a bond servant. I don't come with demands, because I'm a servant. And he goes on to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, 
For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. You know what's miserable? Being an uns- a double-minded man. A double-minded man is this. I know that God is God, but I'm the boss. James says you need to reach the point of surrender and trust in the goodness of God that come what may, you will trust in him and that will bring you great stability. So when things go bad, when you're in pain, when you are uncertain of your future, according to James, you can actually find joy in those moments. How? You remember that all the time, God is God. He is in control and God is good. You know, it's easy to trust God when everything is going well. It is an act of faith to choose to trust God in the bad times. Now these moments of trial do not come outside of the the rule of God. Never is God not in control. God doesn't let you get to these moments and suffer because he is unconcerned. He isn't bringing you there and allowing it because God is cruel. You, you, you don't go through pain and disappointment because God is not involved in your life. God is actually doing a deeper work because he is far more concerned about your character than your circumstances. He is shaping our character for the long term and he uses trouble and, and, and pain and, and that is the instrument he wields in his hand for a better end. Nothing, not even pain, suffering, and disappointment can defeat God's good plan for your life. Man, that brings stability. The testing of your faith is good. It brings you to a place of perseverance. You know, you only know how strong you are when you're tested. I mean, you you don't know if you can lift that weight until you lift it, right? God says, I know what's going on. I'm going to allow this testing because I'm going to be there with you. And in that test, I'm building into your life So the first part of Daniel's story is trouble. The second thing that takes place in this chapter is Daniel is brainwashed. It was the intention of the Babylonians to absorb him into their culture. Now just imagine what it was like for Daniel at 15 to witness the fall of his country And then the soldiers come marching to his house, knock on the door, open the door, and they take the 15-year-old boy in that household, and he's carried off to Babylon. He is separated from his family, from his homeland, from his people. He didn't know what was going to happen to him. Fear had to be one of the emotions within him as he made the 1,600-mile journey from Jerusalem to Babylon. Do you know how far 1,600 miles is? It's 1,600 miles from Springfield, Missouri to Los Angeles, California. You know, I remember as a young 18-year-old leaving the Philippines and flying to the United States, and now I'm in a different country, a different environment, because I was a missionary kid, and I felt the distance. Boy, that was unsettling. Daniel felt the distance. Now, thankfully, I got to travel that long distance in an airplane. I don't know exactly how Daniel traveled, but he didn't drive a car. It was a long trip. You and I can get to Los Angeles, 1,600 miles in our cars, in about two to three days. Now, when I took my son to California, when he moved out there, I told him, I'm not doing 12-hour days in a car. Uh Uh-uh. I'm this old, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take three days. 
We're going to drive eight hours. We're going to stop, have dinner. We're going to go see a movie and have a good time. We're going to make an outing of this trip because I can't stand the idea of getting in a car in Springfield, Missouri, loaded up with all of his stuff and driving straight to Los Angeles. And you know what? It was one of my most treasured experiences with my son. We had such a great time. But we were in a car. The level of trauma endured by 15-year-old Daniel cannot be exaggerated. As he traveled, he remembered what it was as he watched the the enemy come in and kill the people around him. Uh, He he didn't know what his future was going to be. Would he be tortured? Would he be sold into slavery? I mean, as he made this incredible trip to a very strange place and a different culture, he had no idea what his future would be like. And then the plan unfolds. Verse 3. Then the king instructed Aspen as the master of his eunuchs to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom, in whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, to Azariah Abednego. Okay, so what's going on here? Turns out there's no torture. They're in an elite program. They will become foreigners turned into Babylonian noblemen. Daniel and his friends were young, good-looking, smart, able to learn. Now, make no mistake, the king was not paying their tuition out of the goodness of his heart. You know when people give you stuff, Oftentimes, something's coming with that. Do you know what I'm talking about? Daniel was going, they they were going to try to get this little Jewish boy to be no more. He would be absorbed into the Babylonian system. He would become Babylonian. Daniel the Hebrew boy that left Jerusalem would be absorbed and brainwashed and changed. His name who meant God is my judge. Now that was some interesting parenting there. I mean, every time his name was spoken, Daniel and the people around him were reminded that God is the one who is the judge. Now that's, that's, a, that's a great idea, I think. Um, His name was changed to Belteshazzar. Bel is the pagan god, and it really is a combination that says, Bel will protect the king. They would be educated in the language and the literature of Babylon. He was to become nobility. He was carefully vetted. He was enrolled in a three-year rigorous program of academic uh, and leadership training. There was no mistake, the king was managing an agenda. It's interesting that this absorption into the culture is through literature and language. Language is a powerful tool often used to conform people to the standards and the philosophies of the world. You know, Babylon throughout the Bible stands for the organization and power of a secular, godless world system. From Genesis, I mean, from all the way to Revelation, Babylon represents that. It's, it's what man can do. It, it, is, it is not all about God. Now, we live in a day where politically correct language is being imposed on us. Anybody here notice that? 
I mean, we're supposed to say partner as opposed to husband and wife. That language implies so much. Unwanted pregnancy as opposed to unborn human being. We like to use the word inappropriate rather than wrong or sinful. There's, there's a thing called assisted dying rather than just killing. Um, there is this new politically correct thing called gender identity, which honestly, at my age, appears to be recently invented. Anybody agree with me? As opposed to gender. By working to change the language, our culture is working to conform us to a new value system. But make no mistake, this has been going on since Daniel and the Babylonians. Notice how your vocabulary has changed. Notice how the things that used to shock you now seem pretty ordinary. Do, do you feel it? Am I the only one who's feeling this? Literature doesn't just include books, but it also comes through a, our highly politicized educational system. You know, additionally, everything in print and electronic media has a message. It's working to absorb you. Not to mention the internet, entertainment, social media, professional associations, medical terminology and practice, and more want to get your attention and make you conform. And language and literature have always been and continue to be powerful tools to make you conform. And if you don't conform, you get canceled. Canceled in education, canceled in business, entertainment, at work, in your community. community. But what I want you to see is that this is not a new thing. Brainwashing, this canceling out of who you are in order to become what everybody else or the world system wants you to be, be was all the way back in this story of Daniel. The brainwashing was there. Third, and maybe the most important point, just say no and draw a boundary. That's what Daniel did. Now, one of the very effective tools of assimilation used by the king wasn't torture or imprisonment. It was rewards. It was the good life. These new recruits would be further controlled because they were allowed to eat from the king's table. Now, this was no college cafeteria, mind you, for these prisoners of war. This was the best food that Babylon had to offer, the best food they had ever seen or even been ever eaten. Now, and here was Daniel. All of a sudden, Daniel says no. He draws a boundary. What is he doing? He's protecting his sense of self and identity. He was trying to resist this effort to be sucked in and absorbed by the culture. He had changed his location. He couldn't control that. Even his name was changed, and even that he couldn't control. And the powers that were at work were trying to cancel out Daniel, the Hebrew boy, who, who believed in the God of heaven. They wanted to remove the testimony of that God. Notice how wise Daniel was. Notice his humble and respectful approach to setting up a boundary. He humbly asks the leader, would you please allow us to only eat vegetables? Any vegans in the house? 
Not many in Missouri, huh? Verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not, notice he requested, of the chief, he requested that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. Daniel, once again, it's the, it's, it's the, the power of the person in front of you, and yet the sovereign will and working of an almighty God are always working together. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I mean, this guy likes Daniel. I fear the Lord, the king, who has appointed your food and drink. Why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. Well, now that's a pretty serious concern, don't you think? You know, even for Daniel making this request as a prisoner of war, he puts, he puts his life at risk. Because when you make this kind of a request, you never know what's going to happen. Daniel didn't know, but he makes the request anyway. So Daniel, wise, says to the steward whom the, uh, uh, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetable to eat and water to drink and let our appearance be examined before you in the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies and as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So what does he do? He, he sets up an experiment. He puts himself in the hand of God. So this man consented with them regarding this matter and tested them 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of, of, the, of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding uh, in all vision and dreams. He's 15 years old. He feels himself being sucked into this very powerful, affluent culture. But Daniel doesn't want to lose himself. He doesn't want to be captured. He doesn't want to become a slave, even with good things, to the Babylonians. You know what? The Babylonians were really impressive. The, the gate that goes into the, to the Babylonian uh, palace is on display in the Museum of Berlin. There it is, look at that gate. It's blue and beautiful. And it's, it's like when you walk into the, you know, a place that you look around and you're like, this is incredible. That's, that's exactly what they wanted the people to think. Uh, can you imagine Daniel walking down the beautiful blue corridor of the palace? It was magnificent. It was a bold declaration of the success and the opulence of this secular society. God really did look discredited. And we would be tempted at times like this to think, well, it doesn't look like God is winning all that much. I read about a first year college student who said this, it is not the temptation of sex and drink that I found the hardest thing. It is being surrounded by people who live as if Jesus wasn't there, and yet they look incredibly successful, enjoying life more than I am. If secular and godless culture look incredibly strong and free, and Christianity looks weak or false, what are we to do? Notice what Daniel does. Daniel does not get sucked in to the culture. Daniel knows that God is always in control and he seeks to honor God. Now, um, you know, I think there was a part of Daniel because I believe Daniel truly loved God. He began to have a sense of panic. What's going to happen to my people? What's going to happen to the testimony of our God? Will we all be lost? Will the power and the presence and the goodness and trustworthiness of the God I know, will it be lost forever? So Daniel puts up a fight and he says no to the food 
and he establishes a boundary so that all will know and he himself will know I'm not owned by the Babylonians. I still am this Hebrew boy dedicated to the God who is the creator of heaven and earth. Man, I just love Daniel. He's 15. He chooses not to eat. You know, I, I wonder, are, are we wise enough to set up boundaries in our lives to remind ourselves who we are, who God is, and what life is really about? Can I just suggest a few boundaries, a few things to do that will keep you from being sucked into the world around you? It, these are very simple. These are also found as uh, commands in the New Testament. You know, the most important things that you and I have are time, money, and relationships. Would you agree? So when it comes to time, what does the New Testament talk about? It says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And so when I hear people say, oh, I just don't have time to come to church anymore, it scares me for them. What if we were to make time every week? And many of you, are here, so you did. You know what that is? That's a way of you not getting absorbed. It's a way where you remind yourself and those around you that you are not going to become a slave to the system. Second, money. You know, when we tithe, giving the first 10% of our income, when we give, you know, we love to keep money. Money is so powerful. And the only way to defeat money and greed is to give it away. You know what, that's, that's kind of like, that's, you know, the term stick it to the man. Well, you know, you, you get money. If you don't ever give money away, money gets to control you. But when you give it away, you're controlling it. What a wonderful thing. Relationships. God tells us that we need to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. And so when we decide that we're gonna prioritize treating the people around us like we treat God with love and respect and honor, when we love and forgive and even bless the people in our lives who are our enemies, you know what? Those are boundaries. It keeps us from being absorbed. In verse 18 to 21, Daniel and the three Hebrew children go in for their final exam. It wasn't written, it was oral. And guess who the instructor was? It was the mighty Nebuchadnezzar, one of the most powerful men who has ever lived. And he investigates and he asks them questions and he says, you know what I've discovered? I've discovered that these four are 10 times wiser and more capable than even the astrologers and magicians in my court. And that's why they were placed. Do you know how God kept his testimony and power alive in the exile? It was through the people of God who were the remnant who never stopped worshiping God and honoring him and putting him first. How does, how does a person become a captive at 15 and flourish as as a high level influencer in several of the different uh, regimes, you gotta remember who God is. He's always in control. He should first and foremost be honored. I just wanna end with a modern day Daniel, okay? Um, Tim Tebow, anybody ever heard of Tim Tebow here? There's eight of you, that's great. Um, the others of you need to get out more. Um, Tim Tebow is well known as an athlete. He's also well known because of his work in the special needs community. We actually are a host of, of uh, his organization's Night to Shine. It's a prom for special needs adults and it's powerfully reshaped the world in the way people see special needs adults. 
He was also well known for his commitment to bib- biblical sexuality, having a high regard for marriage. He, he was ridiculed because of his commitment to remain pure until he actually married. And then he did get married. And do you know who he married? He married Miss Universe. I think that's a pretty good reward. And the world ridiculed Tim Tebow. Because the world doesn't like anyone who is committed to the design and purpose of God. And you know, really, God, God's design and purpose is so that you and I can flourish. He wrote a book called Mission Possible. And this is what he says, when you live Mission Possible, you live a life that counts because of what God has done and is doing through you. Now this scriptural charge doesn't mean that you have to become a missionary or plant yourself on the other side of the world, nor does it mean that you have to sing worship songs during every waking hour, though if you feel the tug to do that, go for it. But it does mean that your big picture purpose is to bring glory to God whatever, wherever you are. After and only after you latch on to that God-given big picture purpose, there's a way to identify what your personal purpose might be. Within the greater purpose of glorifying God, you find your purpose in what you do every day. Simply put, purpose is about being mission-driven in your ordinary life. Living a mission-possible life means executing the good works that God has already prepared for you to do. This is what Paul was talking about when he wrote, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we, we would walk in them. Ephesians 2.10. You can live a mission possible life because of what Jesus did for you on the cross more than 2,000 years ago. This kind of life is possible only because of the sacrifice he made and the power given to him to trample over death. When you live mission possible, you live a life that counts because of what God has done and is doing through you. It's possible for us to be like Daniel. The, the, you know, the book of Tim Tebow and his life gives us an example. I wanna ask you if you would buy your heads. It's, it's not easy. It requires risk. It requires, it, it, you could be misunderstood, ostracized. You could lose a job. You could be kicked out of an organization. But God is looking for people who will keep his story alive by living their life the way he wants them to live. I'm telling you, if you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that's what you need. If you're here today and you'd like to know God and you'd like to have a relationship with him, I want to tell you that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you'll believe in him today, he will come into your life. What do you have to do? Just believe. Why don't you pray? And just say, God, I come to you today and I ask you to please know that I realize I need forgiveness. I need a savior. I need you in my life. So right now, Jesus, I believe you came to save. You came to pay for my sin. I ask for your salvation. And maybe you're here today and, and you, need to, you need to decide to say no and draw a boundary somewhere. The Holy Spirit of God will show you what that is. Say yes. Because you see, we need to live mission possible lives and accomplish God's plan. Would you stand please? I'm gonna pray and if we can pray with any of you here today, if you have a need, whatever need that is, 
It could be sickness. It could be a problem. If you're here and you need to accept Jesus Christ and you'd like someone to pray with you, we'll be down here to pray with you. So you come. Lord, I thank you for your goodness to us. Help us to honor you with our lives. Bless this time of um, response. I pray that your Holy Spirit would draw people to make right decisions so they could experience all you have for them and glorify you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.